Hello, this is Richard Hammock's Calculus 1 course. We are in part 5 of the course on integration. This is lecture 45a on the substitution rule. Recently we discussed the fundamental theorem of calculus. Through it we realized that the key to evaluating definite integrals is finding indefinite integrals. And to find indefinite integrals, we need integration rules. The substitution rule will be our latest integration rule. So our plan today is to learn about the substitution rule. It's an integration formula that's based on the chain rule for derivatives. It's literally the chain rule in reverse. So if you're familiar with the chain rule, if you're good at using the chain rule, you should have little problem with the substitution rule. In this lecture, lecture 45a, we'll talk about substitution in indefinite integrals. In the next lecture, 45b, we'll apply what we learned today to substitution in definite integrals, and we'll hook that up with the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's jump right in. I'm going to start with uh, reminding you of some integration formulas that you know uh, pretty well by now, hopefully. Um, you've been working lots of odd-numbered ex exercises to get used to the, these, and that's essential because, of course, as you know, we're going to build on all of this. Here's the, um, a partial list of integration formulas that we've talked about, and uh, the only difference is in that in presenting them here this time, I've changed all the variables x's to u's. Otherwise, these are, you know, here's the power rule for integration. Previously, we thought of it as the integral of x to the power of n dx is 1 over n plus 1, x to the power of n plus 1 plus c. Well, I've just changed all the x's to u's. Um, it, it, you know, the, doesn't really matter what variable we're using x or u, they're still the same formulas. And this is not a complete list. We also had these three formulas that told us antiderivatives of functions that have these fractional forms expressed here. And these happen to be, um, the answers happen to be inverse trig functions. And it's kind of interesting. Um, and you'll remember where these came from. For example, we had, uh, way back in chapter four, we had figured out, or chapter three, we figured out the derivative of sine inverse of u was one over the square root of one minus u squared. So we got this integration formula when we ran that in reverse. And the same for these other two. So here's our list of integration formulas so far. And what we're going to do today in introducing this thing called the substitution rule, which is the chain rule in reverse, is we're going to come up with this method that, combined with the formulas on this page, is going to greatly expand the kinds of functions we can integrate. We'll go way beyond this list um, and be able to find antiderivatives of a, a way more functions than we can currently do. And it's going to be entirely analogous to how the chain rule expanded the kinds of derivatives you could do. You had a bunch of derivative formulas, and then combined with the chain rule, those expanded to um, many, many other types of functions that you could find derivatives of. So let me tell you about this substitution rule. I'll develop it on this screen. Suppose you have a function big F, and big F prime is equal to a function little f. Big F prime of x equals little f of x. In other words, big F of x is a function whose derivative is little f of x, so big F of x is an antiderivative of little f of x. And think about what the chain rule says about this situation. The chain rule says that ddx of the composition big F of g of x would be equal to 
the derivative of big F, which is little f, with g of x plugged into it, and then multiplied times g prime of x. That's the chain rule. The derivative of this function equals that function. And remember, whenever we have a derivative formula like this one, the chain rule, we can run it in reverse and get an integration rule. So running this in reverse says that this big F of g of x, since its derivative was f of g of x times g prime of x, then it's an antiderivative. This big F of g of x is an antiderivative of f of g of x times g prime of x. So that formula would read the integral of f of g of x times g prime of x dx equals big F of g of x. And then we know to add on a constant c to get all of the antiderivatives. So you might say that this formula is the reverse chain rule. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a substitution to make this look a little bit simpler. This g of x that pops up in several places, well, let's call that u. Let's say u is equal to g of x. Now we also have some things in this formula like the g prime of x and the dx. Um, I want to follow the consequences of setting u equal to g of x and see how that relates to the g prime of x dx that you see here. If you look at u equals g of x, you can calculate its derivative. du dx would be, well, it would be g prime of x. So the g prime of x that you see right here would be du dx. Now, I'm going to do something that at first may seem a little bit suspect. You'll remember that du dx is just a piece of notation that stands for the derivative g prime of x. And sometimes we actually think about this as an actual fraction. We think about dx as being an extremely small change in x and du as being the corresponding change in u. And so du dx is like rise over run of a, a little tiny triangle that's approximating the slope of the curve at the point x, and that's approximately equal to g prime of x, and better and better approximation for smaller and smaller x. Sometimes we do think about this du and dx as um, quantities. Thinking of it that way, I want you to imagine splitting up this equation by cross-multiplying by dx. Just multiply both sides by dx. And we get du equals g prime of x dx. Well, if you do that, then this g prime of x dx here would be equal to du. And we're going to make those substitutions right here, and an interesting formula is going to pop out. Every time we see a g of x, we're going to replace that with u. This g of x gets replaced with u, and this g of x gets replaced with a u. Because after all, g of x equals u. We made that choice here. And following the consequences of that choice, we got g prime of x dx equals du. So this g prime of x dx equals du. And when we make those substitutions, notice we get this formula that says the integral of f of u du equals big F of u plus c, which is a correct formula because we chose big F to be an antiderivative of little f of x. So these two things really are equal. And these two things up here are equal because that's the chain rule in reverse. And certainly, big F of g of x plus c equals big F of u plus c with the understanding that u is equal to g of x. 
So even if you felt a little bit suspicious about this multiplying through by the dx to get du equals g prime of x dx, you have to agree that this equals this, which equals this, which equals that. In other words, these two things, these two integrals on the left, are equal. And class, the fact that these two integrals are equal, that is called the substitution rule. Summarizing what we have on this page, we get the substitution rule. If u is equal to g of x, then the integral of f of g of x times g prime of x dx equals the integral of f of u du. That's the substitution rule. And for the rest of today's lecture, we're just going to be looking at examples of applying the substitution rule to find integrals. And in every case, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting with a complicated integral like this that you might look at and wonder, how in the world am I ever going to find the antiderivative of that? How will I find the integral of that? Well, using a substitution, u equals g of x, we'll switch that to a simple integral like the integral of f of u du. And our goal is to have the integral of f of u du match up with one of those simple integral formulas that we saw in the previous slide, the, one of the simple basic integral formulas that we know. The idea being that this integral that you're trying to find here, it might not match any of those formulas, but this one does. Let's start our examples. In our examples, we'll start with a complicated integral and we'll choose a substitution u equals g of x to try to make it simple. And we're going to do the same thing we did here, take du dx, it'll be g prime of x, and then cross multiply to isolate du and go from here to there, complicated to simple. Here's our first example. Imagine you have the integral of cosine of x squared plus 3 times 2x dx. So you're looking for an antiderivative of that, a function whose derivative is cosine x squared plus 3 and then times 2x. Whenever you work these problems, you should be thinking about what simple integration formula does this most closely resemble. And I think you'd probably agree that this complicated integral, it looks a lot like the integral of cosine u du. And the integral of cosine u du is easy because you know that's equal to sine of u plus c. So our goal is going to be to try to make this one look like this one, integral of cosine u du. And if we were going to do that, then this u that appears here, it would have to be equal to x squared plus 3. So our u is going to be x squared plus 3. To, make it, to turn this cosine of x squared plus 3 into cosine of u. Now, like on the previous slide, we follow the consequences of that choice for u. du dx is the derivative of x squared plus 3, so that's just 2x. And let's cross multiply to get du equals 2x dx. So we have the x squared plus 3 that occurs here, it's equal to u. And notice that 2x dx is equal to du, and 2x dx just happens to be what we have right here. So that's equal to du. So we're going to make those substitutions. The x squared plus 3 is the u, and the 2x dx, according to what we did in the box over here, is equal to du. So look at that. We transformed this complicated integral into the integral of cosine u du, which was our goal. The integral of cosine u du is a simple integral formula 
we know that's sine of u plus c. And finally, we can get our answer by reverting back to the x's. The u was equal to x squared plus 3, so sine of u plus c is equal to sine of x squared plus 3, whole thing plus c. So that is our answer to example 1. That's the antiderivative we're looking for. That's the integral of cosine x squared plus 3, 2x dx. Now, you note know that whenever you're finding antiderivatives, you can check your work. And I think that's a good idea. To check your work, you take the derivative of your answer and see if it gives you the integrand, which was cosine x squared plus 3 times 2x. And let's check that. Let's do ddx of sine x squared plus 3 plus this constant c. And um, let's see, you need the chain rule to take the derivative of sine x squared plus 3. It's going to be cosine of x squared plus 3, then times the derivative of x squared plus 3, which is 2x, plus, and then of course the derivative of c is 0. So we get cosine x squared plus 3 times 2x. And yes, that's the integrand of the problem we started with. So we know we found the correct antiderivative. It checks back. So I recommend as you're doing these problems, uh, check them if you have time to make sure that you didn't make a mistake. So in your homework, on a, your, the, your practice work, on your the, the final exam, if you've got time um, and you have an antiderivative, check it. If it if you got something other than cosine x squared plus 3 times 2x for this problem, then it wouldn't have checked back. You'd go back and look for a mistake somewhere. Example 2. Think about the integral of e to the sine x cosine x dx. Now, that doesn't match any of our simple integration formulas. So, to find this integral, using the substitution rule, we would look at it and think about, well, what simple integration formula does it most closely resemble? And I think you would agree that it looks a lot like, not exactly, but if you look at just the structure of this, it sort of mimics the integral of e to the u du, which is an easy integral because we know that's e to the u plus c. So if we follow this approach, trying to make this look like e to the u du, this power of e, it better be u. So u has to be sine of x here. So let's write that down. u is going to be sine of x. And so du dx is cosine of x, which makes du equal cosine of x dx. Now, jumping back over here, you see a cosine of x dx. Aha! Cosine of x dx equals du. So we can replace cosine x dx with du. And of course, the sine of x gets replaced with u. And making those replacements or substitutions, we get the integral of e to the u du. So we've changed a complicated integral to a simple integral. We know the answer there is e to the u plus c, and then our u is sine of x. So we get an answer of e to the sine of x plus c. That's the antiderivative we're looking at. If you're in doubt about that answer, you can check it, take its derivative, and see if we really get e to the sine of x cosine x. Um, well, we've got to use the chain rule to differentiate e to the power of sine of x. And you get e to the power of sine of x times the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. And sure enough, it checks back. So we did our work correctly. I'm going to mention a theme that I'm going to constantly be coming back to in these problems. It works like this, all of them. You look at your integral that you're starting with. You make a guess about a simple integration formula that it mimics. You choose a u that seems to attain that goal. 
you take du dx and you isolate du, and you get cosine, in this case, cosine x dx in general, g prime of x dx. Now, it absolutely has to match what you have here in order for this procedure to work. And if it doesn't, that means maybe you've chosen the wrong u, or maybe you have to push it a little further, and we'll look at examples of that. But everything has to match up exactly. If you get du equals cosine x dx, before you replace uh, what's right here with du, you got to make sure that's exactly what you have in this equation, du equals cosine x dx, and that's the case here. So we're in good shape in making that substitution. Let's do another example. The integral of x cubed plus x minus 1 to the fifth, 3x squared plus 1 dx. So we're looking for that antiderivative. Well, you see a power of 5 here, so you might say to yourself, this problem looks a lot like the integral of u to the fifth du. And if we were going to make it look like the integral of u to the fifth du, then the thing that's being raised to the power of 5, this x cubed plus x minus 1, then that should be our u. So we'd have to say u equals x cubed plus x minus 1. Following the consequences of that, du dx is 3x squared plus 1. So du is 3x squared plus 1 dx. Now, notice that 3x squared plus 1 dx is exactly what we have right there. So we know we can replace this 3x squared plus 1 dx with a du, because we saw they're equal here. And of course, the x cubed plus x minus 1 that's a u. So making those substitutions turns this complicated integral into the integral of u to the fifth du. And now we can use the power rule for integrals to find that antiderivative. We know this, this is a simple formula, power rule for integrals. Integral of u to the fifth du is 1 6 u to the sixth plus c. That was one of that long list of integral formulas that we had on the second slide of this lecture. Okay, well, um, our u is all of this stuff. So we get 1 sixth x cubed plus x minus 1 to the power of 6 plus c as an answer. Well, um, let's see if that checks back. Let's take the derivative of that. Uh, I got a, let's see, constant multiple rule. I got a 1 6. The 6 will come down here, um, canceling out with the 1 6, leaving with us with an x cubed plus x minus 1 to the power of 6 minus 1. Um, and here's the generalized power rule. We then have to multiply by the derivative of the x cubed plus x minus 1, which is 3x squared plus 1. And the derivative of c is equal to 0. So yes, when we took the derivative of the answer, we got our integrand of our original problem. So good, it checks back, and we're in good shape. Example four, the integral of tangent fifth x secant squared x dx. Now, as you can imagine with these, sometimes you'll try a number of things before you get an exact match for your, um, for your du. Um, and it's natural to go down some blind alleys once or twice. And as you work these problems, you start to develop a sort of sixth sense about what your choice of u should be and what basic integration formula you're, adding, you're aiming for. For this one, you look at this power of 5, tangent x to the power of 5, and you might say, well, that's a lot like the previous problem. It looks something like the integral of u to the fifth du. Um, well, let's, let's try that. If we're aiming for the integral of u to the fifth du, 
then the thing that's being raised to the power of 5 better be our u. And here you have tangent x to the power of 5. So you would get u equals tangent of x. So right here, this would be u to the fifth, matching the u to the fifth we're aiming for. But that leaves a secant squared x dx, and we're hoping to make that equal to du, but we just can't magically say that's going to be equal to du. We've got to check it. It has to all work out. So if u is equal to tangent of x, du dx is secant squared x. So du is secant squared x dx. Aha! So the secant squared x dx, it really does equal du. So making that substitution, the tangent x to the fifth is u to the fifth, and the secant squared x dx, it really does equal du, because that's what we have in the box here. So just like the previous problem, we get the integral of u to the fifth du, which is 1 6 u to the 6 plus c, and that's 1 6 tangent to the 6x plus c, because remember, u is equal to tangent x. So there's our answer. If you're in doubt, check it. Generalized power rule for derivatives says we get tangent to the fifth x secant squared x. Um, so we're good. It checks back. Let's move on. As you can imagine with these problems, they have to be in just the right form um, so that you get an appropriate du. And of course, sometimes they're not going to be in that form. Let me take another one. And this is real similar to this next problem, number five. It's real similar to what we had over here. Um, integral of x cubed plus 3x to the power of 5 times x squared plus 1. So looking at that one, you would say, well, it looks like the integral of u to the fifth du, so you know then that u has to be x cubed plus 3x, because that's what's being raised to the power of 5. du dx is then the derivative of this, so 3x squared plus 3 which makes our du equal to 3x squared plus 3dx. Now let's jump back over here and start making these substitutions. Since u is equal to x cubed plus 3x, then the x cubed plus 3x to the fifth is u to the fifth. And we want that to be u to the fifth du to match that really simple integration formula. But look what we have here, x squared plus 1 dx. We want to change that to a du. Uh, but look at the box. du does not equal x squared plus 1 dx. du actually equals 3x squared plus 3 dx. So what we see here does not match du. There's no match. So this is not working. So we can't go forward. We haven't transformed this complicated integral into a simple one here. It just doesn't, it just doesn't match up. But jumping back to the box over here, notice that this du, which is 3x squared plus 3 dx, it actually is pretty close to x squared plus 1 dx. It's just three times that. So what we could do is to convert this 3x squared plus 3 dx into an x squared plus 1 dx, just multiply both sides of this equation by a third. So doing that, we see that 1 third du equals x squared plus 1 dx. We took both sides of this equation, multiplied by a 1, one third. And now we have on the right hand side here, x squared plus 1 dx, and it exactly matches the x squared plus 1 dx here. So that tells us what the problem was. We couldn't replace x squared plus 1 dx with du because it wasn't equal to du, but it is equal to 1 third du. 
So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to replace the x squared plus 1 dx with what it's equal to, 1 third du. So that looks pretty good. We've got a constant of 1 third here. We can factor that 1 third out with a property of antiderivatives. We get 1 third u to the fifth du. Aha! Okay. And we get that's the power rule for integration right there, which tells us we have one-third u to the sixth over six plus c. And now we can replace that u with x cubed, with what it's equal to. It's equal to x cubed plus 3x. And here's our answer. x cubed plus 3x to the power of 6 over 18, which is the 3 times 6 on bottom, plus a constant. Well, um, if you're doubtful, check it. Take the derivative of x cubed, the derivative of what's in the box here, um, and let's see, we've got a constant of 1 18th. We could think about factoring that out. Just take the derivative of x cubed plus 3x to the power of 6, and you've got to use a chain rule there. Um, and you'll notice that in doing so, you, have a, you pick up a 6 here. You can factor out a 3 from this expression here, the 3 times the 6 is 18, divided by 18, those cancel out, and it just leaves you with x cubed plus 3x plus times to the power of 5 times x squared plus 1, which is what you started with in your integrand. So, good, it worked. We double checked it. Let's try another one. Integral of sine pi x dx. Maybe this one you think of as looking a little bit easier um, because it definitely looks like the integral of sine of u du. doesn't take much imagination there. So if we're going to make it look like that, then the u has to be what's inside of the sine. u is pi x. Okay, good. So du dx is pi. And du equals pi dx. Okay. So we want to turn this into the integral of sine of u du. So the pi x really does equal u. So the sine of pi x is equal to pi u. Good. We're good there. Um, and we want to change this dx, the stuff that's here. That should turn into a du, but it doesn't match because du does not equal dx. In fact, we saw over here that du is pi times dx. Well, let's take our cue from what happened here. We could isolate this dx by multiplying both sides by 1 over pi. Multiplying both sides of du equals pi dx by 1 over pi, we get 1 over pi du equals dx. So we didn't have a match here because dx was not equal to du, but now we see that dx is actually equal to 1 over pi du, so we can make that substitution. Replace dx with what it's equal to, 1 over pi times du. Now that 1 over pi can factor out of the integral, and we get 1 over pi sine of u du, and we're in good shape because we know that the integral of sine of u is cosine of u. I beg your pardon. We know that the integral of sine of u du is negative cosine of u. Um, so this becomes negative 1 over pi cosine of u plus c. And all we have to do is plug in the u equals pi x. And we've got our answer. And you can check that if you want to. Take the derivative of this, you will get sine of pi x. Okay. Another example. The integral of 4 x cubed plus 1 all over 5x to the fourth 5x plus 5x minus 3 dx. So if you look at this one and analyze what's going on 
and looking and you're looking for some structure, that is the form of 1 over the denominator 5x to the fourth plus 5x minus 3. And then we'll scoot this 4x plus cubed plus 1 over to the side here. You've got 1 over of a function times another function dx. Mm, and looking at that, it sort of looks like the integral of 1 over u du. Now, let's aim for that, because if we can make it have the form of 1 over u du, this is one of our simple integration formula, formulas. The answer to that is ln of u plus c, or ln of the absolute value of u plus c, as we know. So if we're going to achieve this simple structure, it looks like our u would have to be what's on the denominator over here. And that's u equals x to the 5x to the fourth plus 5x minus 3. But of course, we have to follow the consequences of that. Its derivative, du dx, would then be 4 times 5x um, the typo here, this should be uh, 20x cubed, sorry about that, um, I forgot the subscript, um, and then plus the derivative of 5x is plus 5 minus 3. So sorry about that, that, uh, that cube is missing right there, but it is here. So cross multiplying by the dx, we get du is 20x cubed plus 5 dx. So we would want to replace this 4x cubed plus 1 dx here with a du, but it's simply not equal to a du. The du is 20x cubed plus 5 dx. Well, you look at that for about two seconds, and you can see, well, 20x cubed plus 5, that's 5 times the 4x cubed plus 1. So why not multiply both sides of this equation by 1 fifth to get 1 fifth du is 4x cubed plus 1 dx. And that's a perfect match for what we have up here, where we were left hanging. We now see that the 4x cubed plus 1 dx is one-fifth du. So let's make those substitutions. We're now going to change this denominator to what it's equal to, a u, and change the 4x cubed plus 1 dx to what it's equal to, which is one-fifth du. And there we go. This turns into the integral of 1 over u times one-fifth du. Factoring out the one-fifth, it's one-fifth integral of one over u du, and that's one-fifth ln of the absolute value of u plus c, and u is equal to 5x to the fourth plus 5x minus 3. So our answer is in the box here, answer of one-fifth ln absolute value of 5x to the fourth plus 5x minus 3 plus C. So there we go. Um, and I won't do it here, but you could check this if you wanted to. Take the derivative of this with known differentiation formulas. You'd have to use a chain rule, cancel out things, and you'll find that you do get your integrand back. Next example, number eight, integral of e to the x over one, square root of one minus e to the two x dx. Okay, um, now I said earlier, as you're working with these, when you first start out, you, you, you go down some blind, blind alleys sometimes, and it, there's a certain amount of a trial and error to this um, substitution rule and applying the substitution rule, and that, that's normal. It's a little bit of an art getting things to, you know, seeing a few steps ahead to figure out what to do. 
And in fact, even when you get good at the substitution rule, you'll, you'll sometimes make a wrong choice for a substitution. And I want to illustrate that with this problem. Um, because if you look at it, it has the form of the integral of 1 minus e to the 2x to the power of negative 1 half then times e, e to the power of x times dx. It looks like this. So you would look at that and very legitimately say that, well, that looks a lot like the integral of u to the power of minus 1 half du. Um, and you'd be right. It does. So you would then say, well, I want my u to be 1 minus e to the 2x. That's what's being raised to the power of minus half, 1 half here. So there we go u equals 1 minus e to the 2x. We follow the consequences of that. du dx would be the derivative of this. And notice we have to use the chain rule, the derivative. The, well, of course, the derivative of 1 is 0. We have negative and the derivative of e to the 2x. That would be e to the 2x times the derivative of 2x, which is times 2. So du dx is, by the chain rule, um, minus 2 e to the power of 2x. And um, then going through or, you know, the, the sort of the steps that we've been through before, multiply both sides by dx, and you have a factor of minus 2 that doesn't appear over here, so you're going to multiply then both sides of this by negative 1 half. Um, and you get e to the 2x dx equals negative 1 half du. Um, and that's a problem, because look what happens over here. This thing that you want it to be equal to du, it's e to the x dx. Um, and we don't have an e to the x dx here, we have an e to the 2x dx. If you could just get rid of that 2, we'd have a perfect match, and you could replace e to the x dx with negative 1 half du. But it doesn't match. You can't get away from the fact that you have an e to the x dx here and not there. So there's not, we can't replace the e to the x dx with any you know, multiple of du here. There's just no match. There's just no way to get that 2 out of the picture. It's not a constant times this that you could you know, multiply both sides by the reciprocal of. It's way up there in the exponent. And so you're stuck. Um, and whenever you're in a situation like this, you didn't do anything wrong. All you did is it looks like you chose the wrong u. You're aiming for the wrong integration formula. Um, and in a situation like this, which is totally normal, you're going to stop and you're going to go, OK, We've got to regroup. We've got to try something else. So let's start over again with this problem. So it's the integral of e to the x over square root of 1 minus e to the 2x dx. So let's think of um, another simple integration formula that this might remind us of. It, this, you know, this simple power rule thing didn't work for us. What else could it be? Well, remember. Um, before I do that, let's, let's scoop this e to the x over here to the right next to the dx and look at the form that this has. Um, I'm going to write my e to the 2x as e to the x squared, um, like that, because you know, after all, e to the x squared is e to the 2x. And if you look at this, if that e to the x, if you change that to a u, you get 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. This looks a lot like the integral of 1 over square root of 1 minus u squared du. And remember, that's one of our simple integration formulas. That's um, sine of u plus c. So let's try this strategy. Since this looks like this integration formula, with the u squared down here corresponding to the e to the x squared, that means our u should be e to the x to make this 
over here match up with that. So let's try u equals e to the x. You see, we're getting a different u from what we had previously. Well, if u is equal to d, e to the x, then du dx is e to the x. And that makes du equal e to the x dx. And look at that. This e to the x dx, which was such a problem previously, this e to the x dx, it's exactly equal to du. And of course, the e to the x right here is equal to u. So making those substitutions with the e to the x dx turning into du, we get the integral of 1 over square root of 1 minus u squared du, which is a simple integration formula. We know that's sine inverse of u plus c. And all we have to do is plug in our u equals e to the x to get our final answer here of sine inverse of e to the x plus c. And if you wanted to, you could check this by differentiating your answer, and you would, you would get this. It does work out. So I wanted to do one like number eight here, because you're, this is going to be in your future, um, and it's in everyone's future who uses the substitution rule. You're going to make a wrong choice now and again, uh, especially when you start out. And don't lose heart. Just try something else. Keep try. Sometimes you'll try two or three things before you get it right. And as you work more and more of these, you'll be getting it right more and more often, right off the bat. So work some of these examples to get there. Here's another example. Integral of secant squared square root of x over square root of x dx. I'm going to scoot that square root of x on the bottom over as a 1 over square root of x dx. So we can kind of split this apart and look at its structure. And here you'll see a secant squared of something. And we know that the derivative tangent is secant squared. So Oh, and so the antiderivative secant squared is tangent of x. So this looks like a simple integration formula, integral of secant squared u du. So let's try to make that substitution and see if that works. So here the u would have to be what's inside of the secant squared, which is the square root of x. So u is the square root of x, which is x to the power of 1 half. Following the consequences of that choice for u, du dx would be 1 half u to the power of 1 half minus 1, which is minus 1 half which is 1 over 2 square root of x. So multiplying both sides of this equation by dx, we get our du is 1 over 2 square root of x dx. And you'll notice that that's very, very close to what we actually have up here. It's just missing a 2. Well, that should be no problem. Just multiply both sides of this equation by 2. We get 2 du equals 1 over square root of x dx. We now have a perfect match. The 1 over square root of x dx actually turns out to be equal to 2 times du. And of course, the root x is u. So making those substitutions here, we get integral of secant u times 2 du. We can factor out the 2 times the integral of secant squared du. And we know that the integral of secant squared du is tangent of u. So we get 2 tangent of u plus c. And that's 2 tangent of square root of x plus c as our final answer. If you choose, you can check that by taking the derivative of this in the box. And you will find that you do get secant squared square root of x, whole thing divided by square root of x. It's going to check back. I checked it.
Example 10. Integral of cotangent x dx. Now, I'm doing this one to indicate that sometimes you may want to do a little bit of algebraic manipulation before you can see a good choice for you. Because if you look at this, you certainly don't have an integration formula for cotangent x. Um, but there's nothing really to choose to be your u. I mean, what would you do? u equals x? Well, that changes this into the integral of cotangent u du. Then um, you're, you're sort of going in circles. But let's see if we can get some traction by changing this cotangent x to what it's equal to. It's cosine of x over sine of x. And um, I'll bring that cosine x out on the top right here. Um, and now it's the integral of 1 over sine of x times cosine x dx. And it's suddenly looking like the integral of 1 over u du, because we have this reciprocal here. And if we're going to make it look like that, then the u had better be the sine of x down the bottom here. So let's try this. Let's make u equal sine of x. So du du is then cosine of x. And du is cosine of x dx. In class, look at that. Staring us right in the face is a cosine of x dx, where we dropped off here. So in summary, the cosine x dx is exactly equal to du, and the sine of x equals u. So this becomes um, integral of 1 over u du. And um, I... <laughs> In class, it's a I'm sorry, it's a copy and paste error. I've got a 2 here. That should not be there. That was from when I was making the previous slide. Just erase that 2. I'm going to cover it up now. So we have the integral of 1 over u du. Um, and, and again, erase that 2, please. And that's ln of the absolute value of u plus c. Ah, and it's finally, like, the, the 2 has disappeared. Good. Just erase those two 2's. Um, and replace the u with the sine of x, and we get an answer of ln of the absolute value of sine of x plus c. So there's our answer, and you could check that by differentiating this answer, and you will get um, cosine x over sine of x. You can almost see that instantaneously. Uh, the derivative of ln of sine x will be 1 over sine of x times the derivative of sine of x. That's 1 over sine of x times cosine of x, which does equal this. And it gives you cotangent of x. So it checks back. Well, um, that's it. We've done 10 examples, and I hope this has uh, served as a good illustration. But you're only going to learn so much by watching me do these or watching someone else do these. It's really, really vital and important that you roll up your sleeves and you start working a bunch of these. They're usually pretty quick. Today we applied the substitution rule to indefinite integrals. In our next lecture, we'll apply it to definite integrals and hook it up with the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'll see you then. Goodbye.